Peace TV English, the solution for humanity. When things go wrong, as they sometimes will, when the road you're trudging seems all uphill, when the funds are low and the debts are high, and you want to smile but you have to sigh, when care is pressing you. Bismillah, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to a new episode of Let's Talk. I'm your host, Khalil Amunet. Today's topic is tolerance in Islam. Muslims today often hear about the intolerance of Muslims. They point out that Muslim nations restrict freedom and that religious discrimination is rampant and that terrorism stems from Muslims' thirst for revenge against the non-believers. How can we bring forth the tolerance of Islam? How do we explain to non-Muslims that Islam is actually a tolerant religion? To talk about these topics is Dr. Haytham Al-Haddad, the director of the Muslim Research and Development Foundation, think tank, aiming for solutions for Muslims in the West. You can visit this website, islam21c.com. Assalamu alaikum and welcome. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa Thank you for being here. Jazakallah khair. And also we have Dr. Hatim Al Hajj. He's the director of the Sharia Academy of America. Welcome. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. And of course we have our in studio audience. Assalamu alaikum and welcome, guys. So I'd like to turn the show to Dr. Haytham and he will make an uh, introduction to the talk. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين نبينا محمد صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا. First of all, I'm very glad, Brother Khalil, to discuss this important topic because it is such an intellectual topic that is always misunderstood. I'm very honored to be along with the Dr. Hatim to discuss this. You see, when we discuss this topic, we need to remember a few things. I will put them in points. First of all, any religion, any system, not necessarily a religion, tolerate certain practices and ethos and being intolerable towards certain other practices and ethos. Any system, whether Islamic system or non-Islamic system, whether divine system or non-divine system, man-made law or divine law, any system. This is one thing. The other thing is once we discuss the core issue of this topic, which issues we can tolerate and which issues we cannot tolerate. We need to ask ourselves a very fundamental question. Who decides for that? Who decides what is tolerance? Yes. Who decides what can be tolerated, what cannot be tolerated? Who decides that? As you know, simply for Muslims, we believe that there is a neutral entity. And that entity is not a human being. That entity is the creator of human beings. And we feel just from a rational perspective, along from a textual perspective, that the most qualified entity to define what is right, what is wrong for human beings is that entity which is the creator, Allah Jalla Ala ya'lamu man khalaq. Doesn't he know what he created or doesn't the one who created know what he has created? So this is our belief. Now, if we put this aside for a moment, all non-Islamic systems, they don't go back to the divine to receive what is right and what is wrong. They themselves define, as some intellectuals say, they define themselves beauty, or they define what is right, what is wrong. Now, when we say that people define for themselves, then this brings us to the democratic process or uh, democracy. And the criticism regarding democracy, because democracy is the decision of people, as we know. So can people decide for themselves, are they the best to define what is right, what is wrong? Are they the best people to define what is tolerance, where we can tolerate and where we can't? So this is a big question mark. I'm just posing questions okay. in order to understand the topic in a very structured and systematic way. Otherwise, we put ourselves, unfortunately, like 
what is happening now in a defensive mode. And we start using an apologetic terminology. Or some of us might be very aggressive. No, let us pose neutral questions. But these questions are very important to be understood in order to clarify the Islamic position or even any other position. So this is another question. The third question, we need to understand how do we view our life as Muslims? This is a very fundamental point because we view our life as it is a test. Created life and death just for one purpose, which is what? A test. What does that mean? Our life is divided. Our life, not Muslims' life, our life as human beings, this life, is divided into two parts. Life before death and life after death. Life after death is longer, more important, and it is the final destination. So, once we talk about tolerance, we need to have this link between life after death and this life and how tolerance fits into this equation. We believe as Muslims that anything we need to do in this life, including tolerance, including tolerating or not tolerating certain practices, all is linked to our life after death because it is the most important part of our life. al hayawan as Allah Jalla wa ala called it in, in the Quran, the continuous long-lasting life. So this is a third point that we need to put in mind. The fourth point that we need to put in mind when we discuss tolerance is that let us go back to history because sometimes there are theories and those theories cannot be put into practice. And let us see throughout history who were the most tolerating nation worldwide. And many people look at the current history and look at the current uh, liberal uh, countries that started to exist only after the Second World War, only after the Second World War. And they look at some practices in America or even in, in, uh, in Britain or elsewhere in European countries and they see, well, see, you cannot compare the tolerance they have with a tolerance in Islam. And they, they, they have the ultimate tolerance for everything. Exactly. And they don't have a totalitarian view about tolerance practiced in these Western countries. And they don't look at history as well. So what are some examples of over-tolerance from the Western nations? See, as I said, the first point that we have mentioned is that who defines what? So for the West, they tolerate certain practices, but they don't tolerate certain other practices. Same thing for Muslims. But they accuse Muslims that they don't tolerate what they tolerate. So why do they take their standard as the ultimate standard, as the standard, and judge others according to their standard? We can say the same thing. We can judge them according to our standard. And that's why we will have an end block, as they say, or a blocked end. So if we discuss it from this perspective, we need to take other uh, dimensions and bring other dimensions into perspective. For example, in the West, I challenged a number of people. I said, how many people were killed by non-Muslims even after the Second World War or during the Second World War? Forget about Muslims being killed by non-Muslims. No, I'm talking about non-Muslims killed by non-Muslims. You know Nagasaki and Hiroshima and what happened there. America killed in Vietnam more than 4 million people. Many people, when we start talking about this, they say, always we blame others. No, here we are in a comparative discussion. And if you want to start by accusing Muslims that they are intolerant people, then we can pose also the same accusation towards others. So if it is a matter of accusations, then we can say that from Western perspective, there are certain proofs that make it very evident that oh, the, the West was not tolerant to many other practices that they don't accept in the first place. The, the majority of the people don't necessarily choose the most tolerant way. Dr. Hatim al I'd like to uh, get your uh, introduction also. Well, I uh, maybe after 
look at it from a different perspective, which is uh, if we do a little bit of introspection and we examine our conditions, we may be sometimes intolerant, but we want to ask ourselves and we want to pose this question whether this intolerance of Muslims is is because of their Islam or because of some other factors. And we also want to look at those practices that are intolerant that could be attributed to some Muslims. Are they representative of all Muslims or not? If you look at the first issue, which is the, the mistakes that Muslims may, may commit, are they because of their Islam or not? You will find that uh, throughout the history, the mistakes that may have been committed by some Muslims, such as Al-Hakim Amrullah, for instance, the Sultan of Egypt and, and Syria, who gave the commands to bring down the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. This particular person, was he representative of true Islam? Or of the fact, Muslim's opinion at the time. Yeah, or of Muslim opinion at the time. Well, that's the second issue, uh, whether those people are representative of Muslim opinion. The first is whether this is representative of Islam. In fact, Al-Hakim bi Amrullah, who used to rule over Egypt and the greater Syria, Sham, which is greater Syria, is a heretic. He's, uh, yes, yes. And he is the one who actually ordered not only the destruction of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, but also Cairo, which is his capital city. So the man was not a stable person at all. He was not representative of Islam in any way, shape, or form. In fact, he was accused of heresy. I think he and ended up dying mysteriously or something. Yeah, he ended up fleeing and dying mysteriously, and some people have certain beliefs regarding him, and etc. That it's all considered the category That's of heresy. Right. But the second question is whether a person like this is a representative of the public opinion, the common folk in Muslim countries. Uh, certainly not. So they are not representative of Islam. They are not representative of the public opinion. I usually say to people like in America where I live that it is quite important that you stand up to injustice because since you have democratic uh, regimes and your governments are supposedly representative of the people, then the burden on you is much greater than, you know, historically, for instance, Richard the Lionhearted, you know, leading a crusade against the Muslim East uh, may have not been representative of public opinion in England. May have or may have not been. But he did not really consult public opinion. But since there is more say for the people in Western countries, then they should be really quite careful about what their governments do because if someone blamed the country for a mistake, then it's a little bit more acceptable than to blame people during the time of Richard the Lionhearted for a decision that Richard the Lionhearted made. So these are two important points that when a mistake is committed by Muslims, because Muslims are not infallible, it is not because of their Islam, and when a mistake is committed by some Muslims, it is usually not representative of the common public opinion. We're going to go to a break right now. Please don't go away. Every action depends upon its intention. Intention sincere. What is your intention? Why do you do what you do? Concentration, focus, dedication, dynamic. Every single aspect of your mind, of your soul, of your heart. Is it for Allah, sincerely for Him? 
or is it for something else? Is it for something else? Get going on how to improve your prayers. The purpose of these talks is to counter exactly that type of behavior. Join Abdul Rahim Green. In other words, with the outward action, there is also an inner dimension. An inner dimension. In Inner Dimensions of Worship, every Wednesday at 8 p.m. and repeat telecast at 8.30 a.m. UK on Peace TV. In these times of ignorance and confusion, we have never been more in need of holding on firmly to our Islamic belief. Those simple things that define you as a Muslim and teaching them to our families and our children. Join me, Muhammad Tim Humble, as we go back to basics in the basics of a Muslim's belief. Polish your personality in the light of divine wisdom to live like a true Muslim in the basics of a Muslim's belief every Wednesday at 7 p.m. and repeat telecast at 12 p.m. UK on Peace TV. through our Islamic past to find lessons for our Islamic future. Perceive the unusual and consistent progress of Islam due to its unique attitude with the passage of time in Lessons from Islamic History, next on Peace TV. Welcome back and thank you for staying with us. So we're talking about leadership making sometimes intolerant decisions. What is the place of forgiveness in tolerance? How do Muslims, how do we forgive the intolerant? And is that a form of tolerance? Oh, we have uh, three degrees of, uh, or uh, three responses to, uh, to injustice. The first one is uh, to, in fact, we have four. But three were mentioned in one ayah. وَإِنْ عَقَبْتُمْ فَعَقِبُوا بِمِثْلِ مَا عَقِبْتُمْ بِهِ This is the first degree. And if you punish, then punish in a way that is comparable to the way you were punished or in a way that's equal to the way you were punished. So, or if you strike back, strike back in a way that is equal to the way you were beaten in the first time. So that's the first one, which is, you know, establishment of justice not an iota more than what is what's just so you can when you have experienced something that wasn't uh, tolerant like you were wrong to uh, when you you can see uh, you can seek retribution you can seek retaliation but you you could not seek more than what has been inflicted on you like even in Kisas, which is the laws of retribution if there is a wound that was inflicted on you, but it cannot be inflicted on the perpetrator uh, without the possibility of excessiveness, then that... So that, that is a form of tolerance that will be dropped. in Islam. The, the, no, no wound that will be inflicted on the perpetrator because of the possibility of excessiveness. So that's the first degree. The second one would be to suppress your anger. The third one is to clear your heart from any hard feelings. The third one is to do acts of kindness towards those who, who have oppressed, wronged you. oppressed you. I have to say that although this applies amongst individuals, it may not necessarily apply in the same manner with regard to communal 
Uh, so like in a societal uh, way or societal, uh, governmental? Yeah. Yeah, well, so if, if like a country attacked a Muslim country, I don't think that this would necessarily... Like we're going to just forgive you for yeah, invading like, or, us. Or, yeah, it doesn't work this way between countries, but this works uh, between individuals. And it would work between individuals if there is no fear that evil will dominate by... By tolerating good that. Good doers tolerating okay. excessiveness or injustice all the time. It is an individual exercise so that you train yourself to be forgiving and to not seek 100% of your rights or complete retribution and, and to pardon others and so on so that God may pardon you and forgive you. Allah Azza wa Jal. And let them pardon and forgive. Don't you want Allah to forgive you? So we don't want to, we want to stress that while you should tolerate some acts of uh, aggression towards you as an individual, perhaps some of your rights were taken. You should not react in such an aggressive manner that you're taking others' rights and being intolerant. So uh, is there extremes to, uh, I think it's turning the other cheek or something, is there an extreme to being over tolerant? And what can that lead to? Well, turning the other cheek, you know, I told you the four degrees, someone oppressed you, you may even give them a gift or a fr like a basket of fruits in exchange. And that would actually change the enemy into a, a dear friend, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said. But this applies to individuals, and the qualifier here is that this practice will not lead to domination of evil, of evil okay. or injustice. Okay. I'm going to turn this uh, new question to uh, Dr. Haytham. We're talking about how some people perceive Muslims as intolerant. And they bring up that sometimes they restrict places of worship of other religions, perhaps churches or synagogues, being built in Islamic nations. Is that something? What do you think about that? Yeah, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. This is a very interesting point. And normally when we receive this question, we start to maybe be apologetic in, in, in terms of the answer. But let us turn the question around. And we say that, okay, maybe we don't tolerate these things. But the non-Muslims, do they tolerate everything from our side? Yes. So, as I said in the beginning, that's why I laid down four important points, areas of discussion. It is true that we don't tolerate certain practices. Every single human being does not tolerate certain practices. Every single nation does not tolerate certain practices. Why don't they allow us to implement Sharia in the West? Do they allow us to do this? I think on a... They perhaps, don't. They don't in an official capacity, yeah. but maybe in a personal way. Yeah, a personal way to a certain to limit. Certain For example, multiple marriage, which they call as polygamy. They accept the person to be married and have a number of mysteries, but they don't accept Muslims to have two or three two wives. Or they don't tolerate this, and they keep criticizing Muslims because of this. So they don't tolerate that, and we don't tolerate certain other aspects. As simple as this. This is the first point that we need to put in mind. In fact, once you see certain things that they don't tolerate, we find that what we tolerate from others, provided that it does not bring harm to the society, is more or far bigger than what others tolerate from Muslims. And the true color has been manifested in some non-Muslim countries. In Switzerland, they stopped what? They and banned minaret ban, minarets. Think, yes. What can you tell me? Can someone explain to me what does minaret? Well, it symbolizes the exactly. It symbolizes exactly. So, yeah. so it symbolizes the presence of Islam. You can see now the level of intolerance once they see, once they feel that their core values being as they said, attacked. So then the true color appears. So there is no discussion to say, well, we don't tolerate certain practices and they tolerate it. No, maybe they tolerate it because of a political stance on a short period of time, but the true color appears. 
In right. France, they don't tolerate a small piece of clothes covering the head. No, covering the head, which is the hijab in certain hijab. places, and niqab. Tell me, what has niqab to do with the local security or with the values of the country or with harming any member of the society? It does not. Well, they believe it's suppressing women's... Okay, so those... Like their women, husbands are forcing them to Okay, do. they could have done one thing. They could have asked women who are wearing it. Exactly. Okay? But they just banned it. So that is just an excuse. It's a huge act of intolerance. Exactly. In so what I meant to say that if Muslims, and this is I'm especially addressing the Muslims, okay, and in particular the youth, because sometimes we, they say, oh, they accuse us of being intolerant, etc. If they accuse us of being intolerant, you have to turn, okay, the table, as they say, and you can show some other practices that they don't tolerate. Okay, thank you for that, uh, Dr. Haytham. That's all the time we have. Uh, we hope you enjoyed this episode. I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Haytham. Thank you very much for coming. And uh, Dr. Hatim, thank you very much. And our in-studio audience, thank you guys as always. That's all the time we have. I hope you enjoyed the episode. Thank you very much, and we'd like to see you guys on another episode. When things go wrong, as they sometimes will When the road you're trudging seems all uphill When things go wrong, as they sometimes will When the road you're trudging seems all uphill When the funds are low and the debts are high And you want to smile, but you have to sigh When care is pressing you down a bit Rest if you must, but do not ever quit. Success is a failure turned inside out. Let's talk and clear the clouds of doubt. Success is a failure turned inside out. Marriage is the cornerstone for a successful society. How can we maintain a successful marriage? Join us in this journey where we learn how to plan for it, execute it, maintain it, and end it according to Islam. Grasp the unique philosophy of Islam to make marriages successful in marriage and divorce. Every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 11 p.m. and repeat telecast at 12.30 p.m. UK on Peace TV. A friendly message by Dr. Zakir, the last testament of God. It is a proclamation to humanity, a fountain of mercy and wisdom, a guide to the erring, a warning to the heedless, an assurance to those in doubt, a solace to the suffering, a hope to those in despair. Al-Quran, the most positive book in the world, the final message of God to humanity. Let's read it. Understand it and follow it. Peace TV, the solution for humanity.